morning, First Baptist Church Aztec. Thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time here, please fill out the guest information tear-off in the bulletin and bring it to the First Cafe to meet Pastor Mike and Cindy and get your favorite soda and candy bar. If you're looking for a church home, you have found a great place. Here are some things happening at First Baptist. It's time to spring forward. Don't forget next Saturday to set your clocks ahead one hour. Young Lives Ablaze for 3rd through 6th grade is coming April 6th to Eastern Hills Church in Albuquerque. Our students will be challenged to learn more about Jesus and share about Jesus. There will be great worship music, speakers, and the amazing chemistry show is back. Early registration will be due by March 22nd, and it is $30. For more information, please contact the church office or Janelle. For more information about upcoming events, check the bulletin or our website at firstaztec.org. Again, thank you for being here today. Now, open your heart and enjoy what God will do the rest of the service. What a joy, what a privilege it is to join with you this morning in worshiping the King of Kings. That's why we're here. I hope that's why you're here. Some of you, some of you may be in church for the very first time, for all I know. And, and I'm glad you're here if that's the case. Uh, it is our prayer as a church family that you, one, you feel at home here. But two, we, we want you to discover who Jesus is. Many of us in this room already have, and we have a personal relationship with him. As a matter of fact, you're going to see a young man... Uh, Kino here in just a second is going to join me in these waters. He has a personal relationship with Christ. And he is following him today in baptism. Baptism does not save us. It does not get us into heaven. Baptism doesn't take away our sins. The only thing that does that is a personal relationship with Jesus. All of that was accomplished when Jesus died on the cross. The reason we're baptized is an act of obedience. It's commanded in scripture that we follow him in baptism. So Kino, would you join me here? in these waters. It's nice and warm. It feels good. They're all jealous. Good man. All right. So we got to visit the other day in, the, in my office, right? You and your parents. Matter of fact, at Master's Voice, it's whenever you kind of started going, hey, I, I need Jesus, right? Well, Kino, let me ask you a question. Have you asked Jesus to forgive you of the wrong things that you've done and ask him to be the, the Lord, the boss of your life? If you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven and have eternal life? Awesome. Well, man, I'm proud of you. And it is my pleasure to baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in the newness of life. Good job, buddy. Good job. Amen. And we do celebrate that. The angels in heaven celebrated the day he accepted Christ, the day he was born again. And so we celebrate that today as a family together. I'm glad you got to be here to experience Keno's baptism. But my question to you this morning is who will be next? Who will be next to follow Christ in baptism? Is it you sitting here today? Do, do you need to receive Christ into your life and ask Him to forgive you the wrong things that you've done? Is that you? If so, you'll have an opportunity to do that at the conclusion of our service, at the end of our time together. Is it someone that you know that you need to go share the gospel with? Maybe a co-worker or a friend or a family member. And maybe they will be the next ones to follow Christ in baptism. Let's take that question, who will be next, to the Father together. Let's do that right now. God, we, we ask. Well, first, Father, we, we just praise you for Kino. We praise you for his salvation. We praise you for our new brother in Christ. Father, there's Sunday school teachers in this room who have taught him and have seen him mature in his understanding. He's got family members here in this place that have 
helped him mature in his understanding and he came to a point where he turned from his sins and he turned to you asking you to save him. We praise you for that. God, we also ask at the same time, who will be next? Is it someone here? God, do, do they need to receive Jesus and follow him in baptism? Is it someone that's already received Christ, but they've never been baptized? They, they need that step of obedience. God, is it someone that you would have us go to? Someone that you're already placing their name their face on our mind. God, is it someone that we'll randomly meet this week that we'll have a divine encounter, a divine appointment with? God, who will be next? We seek you. We seek you together. And we thank you that you're at work all around us, Father. May we be quick to join you. Now, Father, take our praise as we pour it out from our heart. As we express it with our lips and with our hands lifted high, may we worship you, Almighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand together this morning? I want to make one quick announcement so it doesn't disturb later. There will not be children's church, no children leaving the worship center. We're going to have a family worship service today as we observe the Lord's Supper so that they can be involved in that with us this morning. Let's stand and worship.
liberty at Calvary. Amen. Would you please be seated at this time? Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Markle. I'm the bass player for Praise Team, and I've been asked to share my testimony with you today. Um, growing up as a, as a kid, I, I didn't really have a whole lot of religion in my life. Um, I knew of Jesus Christ. My parents had taught me, and so the belief was there, but beyond that, there wasn't much. Um, around the age of 10, I asked my dad about going to church, and we, uh, we loaded up the next Sunday, and we went to church. It was just me and him, and he took me to an LDS service. Um, my dad was raised LDS, and uh, so we went to this first church service, and it, it, well, it really wasn't what I was expecting it to be. It, there wasn't praise. There wasn't any worship. It was more of like a boring business meeting. And so I continued to go with my dad um, just to see if it got any better, and it never really did. Uh, I always felt this confusion and something just wasn't right with me being there and going there. And so I slowly withdrew and quit going to church altogether with him. Um, my dad was raised LDS and my mom was raised Lutheran, so there was always kind of a divide in the house as far as religion goes. We did attend a couple Lutheran services, but um, it, it never, there was never any kind of family cohesiveness with, uh, with uh, going to church. So kind of withdrew from church, um, not, before I didn't, not before I got baptized in the LDS church. And the interesting thing about that, I wasn't asked if I was ready or if I felt right in my heart to get baptized. It was just something expected of you, and you just did that. So got baptized and, you know, moved on. And like I say, I withdrew finally from the LDS church. Um, <clears throat> went, went quite a few years with uh, no church whatsoever. And in 2003, I met my wife, Seconda. And we eventually got married in 2005. And shortly after we were married, um, she started uh, talking about going back to church. And I said, okay, I'm willing to give it a try. And so we came here to First Baptist of Aztec. And uh, for the first time in a long time, it, I felt um, an overwhelming peace. I felt comfortable. Um, um, as a police officer, I've kind of always been taught to watch my back. And even in crowded places with a lot of people, I've always been kind of looking over my shoulder, always watching my back. And like I say, for the first time coming here, um, I felt an overwhelming peace and comfort and kind of lost that, I won't say lost, but just felt uh, comfortable and I didn't have to always look behind me. Sakana started talking to me about uh, my, uh, my relationship with Jesus. And for someone come from the LDS religion and that kind of upbringing, it did, that didn't really make a lot of sense to me. What, what exactly did a relationship with Jesus mean? I got baptized in church. It wasn't that good enough. And so through, through my wife and um, uh, prayer and the pastor, we were able to kind of get me to understand what it meant to have a relationship with Christ and have a, a journey with him. Um, so that took me a while to to work up to and where I was at. Um, in 2010, um, a good friend of mine at work uh, was deployed in Afghanistan and he was killed by a roadside IED. Um, we, uh, I was pretty devastated. He, he was kind of a father figure to me and a super great friend. And so at his funeral service, the pastor that was uh, doing the service, he, uh, I don't remember all the words that he said. It was a very trying day. Um, but he did ask that uh, if there's anyone here today that wants to invite Christ into their heart and, and take that journey with him to please raise your hand. And it was at that moment I knew that this, this was my time. And I raised my hand um, very high and very proudly. I was, I was ready. Um, March of 2011, I finally was baptized here in the church and uh, started, my, started my journey. And... Uh, um, my, my walk with uh, Jesus is a work in progress, but it's been an incredible journey. And I invite anybody here today, if you're ready to start the most incredible journey of your life, please come forward, grab somebody's hand, grab one of us. We'd be happy to sit down and talk with you about it. Matt, thank you. 
God is good. I'll tell you what, it is a, a pleasure this morning to get here and to celebrate the Lord's Supper with you. We're going to be participating in the Lord's Supper here in just a few moments. Um, I'm going to ask you to multitask with me for just a couple of moments. First of the multitask is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you would pull your Bible out or turn your Bible on or unscroll it, or if you don't have one with you, there may be one just in the seat just in front of you underneath. Uh, pull that out, and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, there is a very special event happening this week. Uh, some of you may be aware of, some of you may not be aware of, but this week there is a member of our church family that is turning 100 years old. Wow. So, Miss Frances, Markle Olin, would you, would you stand up for us for just a second? We don't normally do this, but there she is right there. All right. Happy birthday. Let me give you a hug because I may not get to do this after church. So let me give you a hug. Love you. Happy birthday to you. God bless you, dear. All right. Awesome. 100 years old. I, I, hope, I hope I get to, uh, I hope I'm in that good a shape at 100. Amen. On the count of three, everybody say happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday. There you go. All right. I'll tell you what, I, I celebrate with you and I celebrate with her. That's a, that is a milestone and what a blessing it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Now we are in a sermon series and the sermon series is never satisfied. That's the title of the sermon series, never satisfied. Um, why do we look at this? Why, do, why, why should followers of Christ look at our lives as we're never satisfied? Because we should always hunger for more of Jesus. We should always desire more of Jesus. You and I should, matter of fact, we must as followers of Christ desire passionately to have more zeal to tell people about the love of God. We should never be satisfied with where we are in our spiritual life. If you and I find ourselves satisfied as a follower of Christ, we become stagnant. Anybody here ever smelt of stagnant water? Yeah. I do not want my spiritual aroma before the throne of God to be stagnant. I want the aroma of my praise the aroma of my daily walk to be a sweet aroma. One that is pleasing to the Father. One that would be like a, a, a beautiful, a beautiful incense, if you would, continually before the throne of God. Church, I don't want to be satisfied with where I am spiritually. We should not. We must not so how does, the Lord, how does taking the Lord's Supper tie in to this concept of never being satisfied, always growing as a disciple of, of Jesus Christ and the Lord's Supper? Well, to make it even easier, how important is the Lord's Supper to our discipleship? Does the Lord's Supper and discipleship have anything to do with one another? Or are they two totally different concepts? Is being a disciple in this box and taking the Lord's Supper just simply an act of celebration in this box? Are they two totally different things? Well, let me share with you this morning as we look at this, as we look at this passage. My prayer is that you and I leave this time together understanding how the Lord's Supper and discipleship go together. First Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 23 is where I want you to be. Chapter 11, verse 23. 
And we see the very first words of Paul in verse 23. It reads, reading from the Christian Standard Bible, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me, please. Father, from the youngest to the oldest in this place, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would teach us this morning. We submit ourselves to you, Father. Those in this place that have known you and had a personal relationship with you for years and years, God, we submit ourselves to you this morning. For those that are in this room that do not know you, that are trying to figure out who you are and what this relationship with Christ could look like, God, I, I pray you speak to them. I pray they submit themselves to you right now and ask you to speak. And God, would you please show us how discipleship and the Lord's Supper must go together. And the two cannot be separated. In Jesus' name, amen. We find the Apostle Paul here in this verse, 23, and he's writing to the church at Corinth. That's why it's called 1 Corinthians. It was the first letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And he is reminding them, the church at Corinth, he's reminding them of the importance of the Lord's Supper. And Paul states that he has received this teaching from Jesus. Look at it. For I received from the Lord Jesus what I also passed, that's past tense, passed, E-D, passed on to you. The Apostle Paul, you see, there was this time after Paul got saved that he went to uh, Arabia, a desert area, and he spent years with he and Jesus, as Jesus came back, and if you would, Paul went to a, a very special seminary with Jesus at, before Paul began his huge ministry. He received this teaching from Jesus, and he has passed it on to the church. But watch, he is reminding them of the importance of the Lord's Supper, church, family. We need to be reminded of the importance of the Lord's Supper. You and I must not take the Lord's Supper in a flippant manner, but only in reverence and an act of celebration of what has already been accomplished for us and the truth that Jesus is returning soon to take us to be with Him in heaven, but also in remembrance of what it means for you and I as we live and breathe in our daily lives. In verses 23 and 24, as he says, on the night that Jesus was portrayed, if you are a follower of Christ, there could be a point that those close to you betray you. Remember what Jesus said. If they treat me this way, they will treat you this way. So you and I need to be reminded that our Father in heaven will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will always be with us. His love will never abandon us. Period. Amen? Amen. But there could be a day that those who are close to you betray you. And we shouldn't be surprised when that happens. Why? Because that is our flesh and blood just like we are. They are imperfect in their love just like we are. 
the Word of God says in verse 23 and 24, it reminds us that Jesus gave His body. It reminds us that Jesus gave His blood for the gospel and for the kingdom of God. But listen, church, listen. You and I may be called upon to give our body for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We may be called upon to give our blood for the kingdom of God. And some of us today would rally up to that because, man, we're spiritually, some of us are at a a peak with our walk with God, and we would rally up to that real quick, and we would say, yes, give me my cross. I will take it up. I will carry my cross. I will deny myself. I, I will do this. I will gladly die for Jesus. However, we need to ask ourselves, Are we willing to live for Jesus? We may be ready to die for our Lord, but are we prepared to live for our Lord? You see, church, this is that tie-in to discipleship. It is that tie-in between discipleship and the Lord's Supper. They do go together because it reminds us, the Lord's Supper reminds us whose we are, and reminds us how we are to live. Turn turn with me, if you would. We're going to come back to 1 Corinthians, but turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of the body that was sacrificed and the blood that was shed so that you and I could have an eternal hope, so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. But it is also a sincere reminder, church, as to how you and I are to live. Romans 12, 1 and 2, if you got it, say, I got it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Since you and I have been shown this beautiful mercy of God that we will remember when we take the Lord's Supper, as we hold the bread and we take it together, as we hold the juice and we take it together, all followers of Christ, taking it together, you and I will remember the beautiful mercy of God and the fact that the mercy of God is brand new every day. The mercy of God is brand new. I am so glad God does not tire in showing me grace and mercy and love. Because I'm here to tell you, I am not worthy. I am not worthy of the mercy of God. I am not worthy of the grace of God, nor am I deserving of the love of God. But He looks at me as I have repented of my sins and placed my faith and trust in Him. And I've called Him Lord, I've called Him Master, and I've surrendered my life to Him. He says, Mike, now you must live daily as a sacrifice. As a sacrifice, church, a sacrifice doesn't crawl off the altar. A sacrifice stays on the altar and says, here I am. I am a living sacrifice. And the Word of God says, Paul tells the church at Rome, I urge you, I plead with you, I implore you, present your bodies, every aspect of your being as a living sacrifice sacrifice, which means you and I, and he breaks it down, which means you and I are to live a holy life. This is our calling. This is our calling to live a holy life before all mankind and before the Father. Once you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. All your sins have been removed You have been washed white as snow when the Father looks upon us. Yes, that's what He sees, holiness. 
And yet, what do our outer actions speak to others? Our outer actions must speak and reveal the holiness that's on the inside. Jesus took great issue with the Pharisees as they would look, as they would try to parade through town, as the Pharisees in the Word of God would try to parade through town and and show people from the outside how holy they are. Any of you Bible theologians remember what Jesus referred to them as? Whitewashed what? White, whitewashed tombs. Which means you're white on the outside. You look pure, holy, innocent on the outside, but on the inside you're dead and decaying. That's what Jesus was saying to the religious people in his day. Oh God, may it not be so with us. May it not be so with us, Father. And if it is, would you show us so that we can repent of that? You and I have a calling on our lives, and our calling is to live holy. That is our true act of worship before the Father and before all people. As you go to school, as you go to work, you are worshiping God by your actions, by your lips by your eyes, every aspect of our being is an act of worship. You say, Mike, that's so much. Surely we're not expected to be perfect. Yes, we are. We are expected to be perfect. The Word of God says very clearly, be holy as I am holy, says the Father. Be holy as I am holy. You say, yeah, but all we can do is strive for that. I'm going to fail. I'm not going to argue with that. We will fail. We will sin. But that should be the exception and not the rule. We are so quick to give ourselves that out. (laughs) We are so quick to say, well, you know, I'm just not perfect. You've been made perfect. I've been made perfect. We are to strive to live like it. This sin should be the exception in our lives. How do you accomplish this? Paul lays it out in verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. If you got it, say, I got it. Do not be conformed to what? This world, this age. Do not live as the rest of the world does. If you see yourself living as the rest of the world, guess what? You have conformed like the rest of the world. And you're not living your life as an act of worship. I would not be living my life as an act of worship. I must not live as this world lives. I must live differently. Catch this, please. It is vitally important that you and I have Christian role models that we say, man, I want my prayer life to be like theirs. I want want to share the gospel like like they share the gospel. I want to have the freedom to worship like they have the freedom to worship. I want to minister like they minister. I want to make disciples like they make disciples. It's very important that we have role models like that. It is. It's vitally important. As a matter of fact, I I hope you have someone in this church congregation that you could point to right now. If I was to call on you, which I won't, I wish we had time, I'd love to. If I could call on you and say, who's your role model for prayer? Who's your role model for ministry? Who is your role model for making disciples in this church? Who is it? And you could go, this is who it is, Mike. This is who it is. This is who it is. I hope to, I, I hope to achieve where they are one day spiritually. Church, that is vitally important to find people around us. And just as important... Just as important, please hear me, just as important 
is to not point at other Christians and say, well, they do this sin. It's okay if I do it as well. If you know it's wrong, it's wrong. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Period. And we must not justify our sin by saying, so-and-so does it. We must not. If you and I find ourselves living anything less than a transformed life, you and I, as it says in verse 2, must, must transform our mind so that we can discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Church, you want to know what the perfect will of God is? Spend time fasting. Spend time in prayer. As a matter of fact, next Sunday, we're going to focus on the spiritual disciplines. The spiritual disciplines of God and a disciple. How should a disciple of Christ, how should a follower of Christ, one that claims to be a disciple, how should they function in the, in the spiritual disciplines? We're going to talk about that next week. But if, if, you are, if you are stuck, if you go, I don't know what the will of God is, I don't know what, what the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God is, then spend time with the Father in fasting and prayer, and He will open up your mind. He will show you His will. This can be accomplished, church. The Word of God says when we renew our minds, we are able to discern what the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God is. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Because this goes hand in hand with the Lord's Supper. As we take the bread in just a few moments, you will hold this bread. And I want you not only to process the body of Christ and what He did on the cross, but I want you to process your own discipleship. I want you to process your own living sacrifice that you have dedicated your life as a follower of Christ to do. And if you have not yet become a follower of Christ, receive this message as your bar. This is what you are to achieve. Once you turn away from your sins, you ask Christ to forgive you, become the boss of your life. This is how you are to live. You are to strive to be holy. When you get saved today, from this day on, the Spirit of God will live in you, and your strive will be to be holy. And God will give you everything you need to achieve that. He will give you a way out of every sin. But you have to become a follower of His to receive the Spirit of God. To understand the Word of God, which is spiritually discerned, you have to receive the Spirit of God. In order, to receive, in order to receive the Spirit of God, you must first turn from your sins and put your total life on the altar and say, God, I am here. Forgive me. I repent of my sins, and I commit to follow you the rest of my life without shame and without fear. I will be a living sacrifice. As you prepare to get saved today, hear me. That's your prayer. And nothing less. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you got it, say, I got it. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, there's so much we could dive in, but we're going to stay focused. Let us lay aside, watch this. How does the Lord's Supper and, and discipleship go together? It reminds us, the body and the blood of Christ, the bread and the juice reminds us to lay aside every hindrance, every sin that so easily ensnares us. Church, church family, I know what sin easily ensnares me. If, raise your hand if you know what sin easily ensnares you. Raise your hand. You know what it is? Listen, if you're a follower of Christ and you can't pinpoint that sin that so easily hinders you, that so easily ensnares you, you are, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Spiritually, you're in trouble. And, and you need to ask God, God, show me, show me my weaknesses. Show me my, show me what so easily ensnares me. Why is that important? So that you know what to stay clear of. So you know what to stay away from. Maybe you know who to stay away from. 
what to stay away from. The Lord's Supper reminds us to set aside every hindrance to our spiritual walk. Every sin that we can become so ensnared in with. And then it says, and then let us run with endurance. The race or the life, if you would, that is set before us. Do you ever get tired spiritually? The Lord's Supper and discipleship. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of what Christ endured. You see, we go, wow, he, he endured the cross. He did. He, he endured the cross. He endured the shame of all of that. But remember, he was tempted in every way, just like you and I are. And he endured without sin. Remember the 40 days of fasting that Jesus did in the desert? If you're not familiar with that, I'd be glad to show it to you after church. Jesus went away and was tempted. 40 days he fasted and, was, and, and underwent temptation. The likes that you and I will probably never see. And he endured without sin. You and I are to look at our life, take a deep breath, and run our life with endurance. How do we do that effectively? Verse 2, we keep our eyes on Jesus. Again, the Lord's Supper and discipleship goes hand in hand. Because as we hold the bread and we hold the juice, we remember and we keep our eyes on Jesus, the one that is the source of our faith and the perfecter of our faith. The one who for the joy that laid before him endured the cross, despised its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Guess where I'm headed one day? I'm headed to heaven. How about you? How about you? Hear me. How about you? Can you say with the author of, uh, of Hebrews, can you say with myself, can you say with some of us in this room, that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven and have eternal life? Or is that something you're still working on and trying to figure out? If you're still working on it and trying to figure out, hallelujah, I'm so glad you're here today. Because you can know for sure today. We can help you get that nailed down, my friend. And the fear of death will be wiped away. It'll be gone. Hallelujah. Your sin will be all gone. The Word of God says when you turn to Christ, your sin is wiped out. The times of refreshing will come from the Lord. Church, that's what you have received. But who hasn't received this? Do you need to receive Christ? Today is your day. Listen, we appeal with you. We're so glad that you're here as our guest but if you don't accept Christ today and, and, and the trays get passed in front of you don't take it the word of God says number one you're not supposed to if you're not supposed to it's a spiritual matter but secondly it won't have any meaning for you if you haven't become a follower of Christ this has no meaning and you'll just be taking it something that the father considers holy You'll be taken in a very flippant way, which is basically, basically saying it's okay if the blood of Christ was laying here, I would just walk on it because it means nothing to me. So if you're not a follower of Christ, just gladly just take the tray and pass it down to the next person. But I hope you don't have to do that, you see? Because today, you can become a follower of Christ. Today, you can become a child of God. Today, you can be born again. Why not? Why not embrace salvation? Why not embrace the cross of Christ? Why not? If you can think of an excuse, would you start just telling God right where you sit, God, here's my excuses. And see if he doesn't set every one of those aside for you. But Christian, Christian, hear me. 
The Word of God tells us very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11 that we are to examine ourselves and make certain as to why we are taking the Lord's Supper. And if you find yourself today satisfied with where you are spiritually, would you just allow the bread and the juice to pass by you? As your pastor, I love you. But I don't want you to take, and because I love you, I don't want you to take the Lord's Supper in a flippant manner. Well, this is just something that we do. Mike, this is something I've done since I was six years old. And it's just something I do. I don't have to pray about it. I know when the Lord's Supper is being served, I show up at church and I just take it. There's a new shepherd in town. <laughs> don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. According to the Word of God, don't do that. Just take the plate and allow it to pass by. Just pass it on. If, if you are so satisfied and so stagnant with where you are, if that, that means that the blood of Christ has zero meaning to you. That means the body of Christ has zero meaning to you. And your salvation, you got over it years ago. And you haven't been, there, there's no zeal left in your body, your dry bones. Well, hear me. My God can make those dry bones live again. And if today, as a follower of Christ, if you will turn to Him and you'll say, God, I know that if I was to die, I would go to heaven because I'm secure in that. But God, I've lacked zeal for years. My bones have been dead. My spiritual bones died. My spiritual zeal has left me. Tell God, trust me, He's not going to be surprised. He already knows your spiritual condition. And He's waiting for you as only a father can with open arms, full of love, waiting for you to turn to Him and repent would you repent today I don't care how long you've been a follower of Christ I don't care what titles you have before or after your name would you repent today embracing what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ embracing what it means fresh and new church it says in 1st Corinthians chapter 11 verse 27 so then whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord let a person examine himself in this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. You see, it's like this. When we take the Lord's Supper, it's a confirmation of the willingness to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Out from underneath a cruel taskmaster and into the leadership of a loving Savior. The word picture that comes to my mind is... is, is is the Hebrew children as they were under the cruel taskmaster of Pharaoh. And as the Hebrews begin their commitment to follow Jehovah out from under Pharaoh and to the unknown, so have we. And the Lord's Supper reminds us that even when we are in the wilderness we are his followers never satisfied never ever satisfied with where we are spiritually in just a moment we're going to have a time of decision 
Deborah and some of her team are going to come lead us in this. We're going to have a song. We're going to stand. And for those of you that God has brought to this place today and you have not yet accepted Christ, when you stand, you not only stand up, but you step out and you come down. And you'll find some men and women on both sides of me here that are ready to receive you. And they will pray with you. They will encourage you. If you have questions for them that they don't have the answers to, they're going to look at you and they're going to smile and they're going to say, I don't have that answer, but we'll find it together. And they will walk with you. You need to unite with this and make this your church home, then so be it. You need to follow Christ in baptism, then so be it. When you stand up here in just a moment to sing, don't just stand. You stand up, you step out, and you come down. You say, I want this to be my church home. I want to follow Christ in baptism or... I need to become a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. But Christian, member of this church or not, doesn't matter. You're able to take the Lord's Supper with us if you're a follower of Christ. But hear me, Christian, Christian, if you find yourself full of dry bones spiritually, repent. Maybe that means you come and pray with one of these. Pray with me. Come and pray here at this altar. Come and humble yourself before God. But repent today. Don't put it off. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven. For those that are in this place, God, that have never become a follower of yours. God, draw them to yourself. In the name of Jesus Christ, draw them to yourself. Father, for those that need to unite with this church, make this their church home. They've come into this place and they don't have a place they can call home. God, I pray that you would draw them by the power of your spirit and allow them, them to call this home. Father, for those in this place that came in and they're hurting, God, would you grant them the grace to step out and come down and take one of us by the hand and say, I, I, I'm hurting, I'm hurting. Emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, whatever. I, I, I'm hurting. We will pray that God will heal you. If you find yourself in this place and you go, oh, I am so hopeless. I, I am hopeless. I don't know that I can go on another day unless something changes and you find yourself hopeless. Would you stand up? Would you step out? And would you come down and grab one of us by the hand and, and just confess it? I'm, I'm hopeless. Would you pray? Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? I need hope. I need hope. Oh, Father in heaven, as we respond to you publicly and unashamedly, be glorified. You be God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, stand. As you stand, you step out and you come down now. In Jesus' name. Come quickly. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were.
sing this and if you're able to sing it with your eyes closed would you do that for me and here's what I want you to envision I want you to envision the one true king on his throne and your voice it's just you and him and you're singing this straight to him to no one else, to Him. Would you do that? Let's offer that up to God today, right now. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. Hosanna. Because you died you, and rose again. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Amazing love, how can it be? You, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's joy to honor you in all I do I honor you in all, in all I do I honor you
mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever felt familiarity but I would ask you to this morning to not sing over these words as we sing Jesus Christ I think upon your sacrifice when you think upon the cross do you see that pretty picture that's painted over and over that people have hung in their homes nothing wrong with that but the cross was 
far from pretty. Our Savior hung there in agony and was unrecognizable. So when you think upon his sacrifice today, think about that ultimate price that he paid for us. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death.
offered up this praise to you. We glorify you. We praise you. And Father, as we are about to take this bread and this juice, mm, speak to us, your children, about our fellowship of you, our discipleship. In Jesus' name, amen. Our deacons are going to come join me here. Would you have a seat, please? Again, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is a testimony. Let me put it to you like this. This is how a friend of mine put it this week. If baptism symbolizes the wedding, if baptism symbolizes that wedding, then the Lord's Supper is a kiss on the cheek. It's that continual reminder. God says to us, I love you. And our fellowship and our discipleship is our I love you back. Our sacrifice. The parameters of the Lord's Supper is very clear, very simple. If you're a follower of Christ, you get to take the Lord's Supper. If, if, if you feel like that you should not take the Lord's Supper because in examination you cannot make something correct in your life, just cheerfully hand the plate to the next person. It's fine uh, without taking either of the elements. If you are not a follower of Christ, we would ask that you would uh, honor the body and the blood of Christ by not participating, not taking the Lord's Supper. Hopefully one day you will get to do that as my prayer for you. The Word of God says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And so now what we are going to do is, just so you know as a church body what is transpiring, Zane is going to the preschool right now. You go ahead, brother. And uh, he is going to serve the adults in that area. We don't want to forget them. They're part of our family, right? Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, as uh, I hand this out to our guys, they're going to go to their spots, okay? And uh, 
what I want you to also realize, church, is that we will be serving, I think that's it. We will be serving, I think, am I wrong? Do we need one more? Are we good? All right. We will be serving the Lord's Supper to those that are homebound. Our deacons will be taking that to them uh, prayerfully this week is what we hope, but maybe the following week, but it will be soon. Just to make you aware that as a church family, we don't forget those who are unable physically to join us, all right? Gentlemen, would you go ahead and pass the bread? on the body of Christ. As you process just a little piece of bread that's in your hand, would you look at it with me? That little element, that little symbol, that symbolizes the body of our Lord. It is not the body of our Lord. Please do not hear me. It is not the body of our Lord, but it symbolizes the body of our Lord. And it is a reminder of our fellowship our discipleship reminds us to renew our minds daily as we follow after you. 
Father, be glorified. And we praise you. We thank you for the body of Jesus. We thank you for the reminder that it is to us today of the commitment we made to be disciples, to follow after you. For it's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we live and that we pray. Amen. Let's take the bread together. The Word of God says in the same way, they also took the cup. And Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And I would ask you to take, do the same thing with this. Just take it and hold it. Process, if you would, with me the blood of Christ. Process with me, if you would, the sacrifice the sacrificial life that you and I are called to live. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and
You know, Jesus, Jesus says here that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which means the old covenant has passed away. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. And we get to celebrate that today as we remember the sacrifice that he made for us. You see, that's what this juice represents. It's not the blood, hear me, it's not, but it's a symbol. It's a symbol of the blood that he shed. And he, said, he reminds us, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But may we be busy sharing with others what you have done in our lives and the transformation that you've made in us as you breathe new life into dry bones, oh God, as you fill us fresh with new zeal, new joy in our fellowship of you. We worship you, O oh God. And we remember the sacrifice that you made, the shedding of your blood, and it reminds us, O oh God, of the calling we have as your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the juice together. Okay. Father in heaven, we praise you for this opportunity to get to celebrate this with our family. Oh, Lord. Now, as this church family gives tithes to you, Lord, we realize what a privilege this is and what a joy this is. God, for our guests that are in this place, we thank you and praise you for them. Lord, may, may they uh, be encouraged as they have joined us today. And may they be drawn closer to yourself. The Father, for your children, for the members of this church body, thank you for the privilege of giving. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our ushers should be here to receive the tithes and offerings. Remember the chest of Joash? We're still working on uh, gathering the funds to repair and update our facilities. All right? Thank you. Our beloved Father, please come down and meet us. We are waiting on your touch. Open up the heavens, shower down your presence. We respond to your great love. We won't be satisfied with anything. Satisfied at all. Open up the sky, fall down like rain. We don't want blessings, we want you. Open up the sky, fall down like fire. We don't want anything but you. With anything ordinary, we won't be satisfied at all.
privilege to go to the throne. Am I right? Here we go. Let's go to the throne, the place that we belong, right into his arms. Here we go. Let's go to the throne, the place that we belong, right into his arms. Here we go. Let's go to the throne, the place that we belong. with anything ordinary we won't be satisfied at all we won't be satisfied with anything ordinary we won't be satisfied again that should be our prayer we won't be satisfied with anything ordinary anything ordinary we won't be satisfied at all earthly things. Because earthly things don't matter. They just fade and shatter when we're touched by the divine. Okay. We have uh, one to introduce this morning. She's on her way up here with me. Yeah. Miss Julia came forward today, and uh, she loves standing next to her pastor. <laughs> and uh, she prayed to receive Christ and make Him the Lord and Savior of her life. And we're going to be visiting some more about that um, later this week. Right on, dear? All right, love you. Cindy and I are going to... If you're a guest with us today, uh, on that bulletin, there was a tear-off. If you would make sure and, and tear that off the, and, and bring it to us straight out that door, straight down into the first cafe area, we have, uh, as one, we would like to meet you, and two, First Baptist Church Aztec has a gift we would love to give you. And so we would love to see you right down that hall here in just a moment, all right? All right. We'll close with some prayer. Brother? One announcement. And Joe, if you would tell us what's going on with the youth. There you go. So we are going to be today for Sunday of the month. Um, be here at 3.30. Um, we'll go play with the kids, start eating dinner, clean up, and then we'll go to the hospital. So we're going to be going to the hospital. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you and praise your holy and your righteous name. You are to be glorified, Lord God, and not just in this place, but in our hearts, in our homes, in our cars, at our work. Lord, wherever we walk this week, may we glorify your holy and righteous name. Lord, usher us now out of this place in a safe manner to our homes, Lord God, and may your blessings continue with us. May we take those blessings and pour them out on others in this community that they may know that there is a God in heaven and he loves them. And Lord God, 
lead people into our path this week that we may present your son Jesus Christ to them that they may come and be a part of the fellowship and that they may come to your throne Lord God and receive forgiveness of their sins all of their sins we ask this in Jesus precious name amen, amen. amen.